So we have formulated the perturbation theory for time dependent potentials. Well, actually, we have, an, uh, we have an exact expression, but the perturbation theory concept comes in in that series expansion. Uh, if V is weak enough, the external time dependent potential, then we have to retain only a few terms depending on the need, a first term, a second plus a second term and third term. So that is where the perturbation theory comes in. Actually, actually we have an exact expression. If you sum it to infinity, then you have the exact expression. So once that formulation is in hand, let's now uh, turn our attention to a specific problem. I don't want to call it an example. It is a specific issue. It's the constant potential. Well, constant potential is an interesting concept. In principle, it sounds as if it has nothing to do with the time dependence, but if you really look at it from this perspective, that this is the VT axis, and that's a V, and we take the origin of the time to be T0 equals zero, and this is the time axis. So the potential is zero before the T equals zero, and it is it has the, this value V, which doesn't change in time. That's the meaning of constancy. So we write the V, if you like, in the language of <coughs> mathematical language, then it is V for T positive. So let's <coughs> Consider the problem of starting with, well, by the way, the, let me remind you the structure of the problem. We have a H0 Hamiltonian, which describes the physics in here, whereas in the right-hand side, this additional V is turned on, therefore, for the right-hand side, we have this as the Hamiltonian. And H0 as before is chosen to be a known one, and it has, uh, we know the spectrum. It is a known part and it's the principal part. And if V is small enough as compared to this one, we are going to uh, turn on the perturbation theory or else we can try to solve the problem exactly. But we have seen that only in limited cases, two-state problem that we can handle it exactly, etc. So it has this complete and orthonormal sp discrete spectrum, suppose this is the case. And uh, suppose we have started at the, before at t equals zero, the initial state is one of the specific members of this family. If it is general, of course, we can write it as a superposition in terms of hollow, in terms of the spaces, but let's choose it to be one of those, <coughs> one of them, any one of them. We call it I, I means for in, initial. And then let's ask the question of the transition to N, well, let's take it to be different than I. And this has the advantage of the zeroth order term in that expansion that we have written down comes out to be zero, right? Because if the, you remember the N, CN, let me remind you the definition of the CNT. It is the probability amplitude of finding the time evolved state in the nth eigenstate in here. It started with the i and it ends up as t evolves. We move to a state like that and the probability of finding that in the nth eigenstate is given by the CNT. That was the central point of our time dependent potentials discussion. 
So if I now look at the zeroth order, zeroth order one, we have seen that it is delta and i. And if n is different than the i, then obviously this comes out to be zero. And the cn1 is minus i over h bar dt prime integral from zero to t, zero, because we have chosen our initial time to be zero. E to the i omega n i t prime v n i T prime was the first order Cn. Eventually, we may need to include the second order term, and we'll do that when need arises. For the, for the time being, let me focus exclusively on this first order term and for this particular problem. This for this specific potential that we have chosen. It jumps from zero to a non-zero value suddenly, although this is a bit dangerous if, if you look at it from rigorous mathematical point of view, still let's not worry about such sudden changes and what kind of difficulties it may lead to eventually. For, for this particular problem, it doesn't create any difficulty. Therefore, let's take this V and substitute in here. You see V this V, it is non-zero, but it is independent of the time, so it comes out of the integral. <laughs> no T dependence, that one comes out. And what is remaining is integral from zero to T, E to the I omega N I. T prime, that's a very simple integral, obviously, that we can carry out without any difficulty. And this thing is 1 over i omega n i e to the i omega n i t minus 1. That is the value at the upper limit and minus the lower limit. Lower limit t equals 0, so it is e to the 0 is 1. So these let me simplify this a little bit. So Cn1 then is, i's cancel and you move the minus sign in, therefore it becomes Vni divided by h bar omega 1 minus e to the i omega ni t. It's rearranged to put into this nice form. So that is the first coefficient, the probability density. So if you if you're interested in finding the probability, then we have to take as the zeroth order term is zero for this i different than n case. So we just take the absolute square of this thing to get the probability. It would be two first order two first order, the zeroth order term plus the first order term. Zeroth order term is zero, therefore to first order only this term is the one which contributes. What do we do? We just take the complex conjugate and multiply with itself. So obviously it is two times one minus cosine omega t coming out of there. So if you write the cosine in terms of the half angles, there is a factor of two sine squared. So altogether it is V and I. Sorry, let me take the take the magnitude. So this is H bar squared. Do we get rid of the H bar? No, it's there, right? It's there. So, H bar squared omega ni squared times four sine squared omega ni t divided by two. Well, this is simple trigonometric 
rate relations that I have used without any need to explain. So we have this. Uh, there is no need to look at the square terms at the top equation. There are yes. Yo-yo, you're right. Let's take the magnitude square. Of course you're right. We write something, we have to obey that rule, right? We take now the square and that square becomes that. Okay. So this is going to uh, keep us busy a little bit. We have to discuss what does this mean in detail. It's going to teach us a lot. That's why we have to spend some time on this expression. Let's <clears throat> focus on the profile which I take this to be the profile is omega n i n t. It's a function of the omega n i n t. So let's plot this figure. Okay, it is an even function, therefore I have to look at the graph of it in both positive and negative parts. Well, in order, well, we can plot, we, we don't have to do any rearrangement. We can go ahead and play with this. But for aesthetic reasons, I will do the following. I will write this as sine squared omega n i t divided by 2. And here there is omega n i squared. But there is also a 4 up. Let me put it down here. So it becomes omega n i over 2 squared. But I would like to make this t appearing in here. So let's put a t in here and let's compensate that t by putting the t squared in there. Well, perhaps I could have used different colors so that you could, you, you could see what are the extras that I have added. I put a t squared in here to compensate against the t I have plotted in here. Okay. Well, if you want, if you are experienced enough in this kind of uh, high school mathematics, you didn't have to do all those things. But one nice thing about this form is it is going to, we are going to use these simple mathematical relations. You can verify this by expanding sine in power series expansion, which it starts with x, and the next term is x cubed, and x minus x cubed divided by 3 factorial and the x in the denominator cancels and the leading term is 1. And the, the correction is x squared. So therefore when x goes to 0 it's 1. Obviously the square of it is also when x goes to 0, 1. That's going to uh, simplify the plots a lot. Because when you have the sign uh, then the uh, the zeros and maxima, because sine is an oscillating fun function, right? It has zeros at the when x is multiples of pi, that's zero, pi, two pi, etc. And it is maximum when the x is the multiples of pi over two, right? Pi over two, three pi over two, etc. But the, there is a principle uh, uh, maximum. Because of that interesting uh, property that we have written down, that is when t go, when omega n i goes to zero, then this ratio goes to one, and then the value at the t omega equals zero is t squared. 
So the height of this is t squared. It starts with that t squared, and then it comes down, obviously, symmetrically in both sides. Then it should oscillate, because there is the sine squared. It can never go below the real axis because it's sine squared, so it's going to stay on the upper part. But we shouldn't forget that there is one over, if you call this x, one over x squared. So there is an envelope which this restricts the profile. Well, let, let me try to plot a clean figure. Okay, this is not a good color. Oops, I can try this one. Okay. That's 1 over x squared. And you have this similar one. 1 over x squared, right? x is omega times t over 2. So this is the envelope of this profile. So it comes down, hits 0 cannot go beyond, turns up, goes to its secondary maximum, goes to zero, and then third maximum, etc. So there are, there are these little ripples, and it dies off quite fast. And let's discuss how fast they die. It dies off. Whatever we see in this uh, right-hand side is valid in the left-hand side as well, so we can say it's going to do similar behavior like that, symmetrically. Whatever is happening in the right-hand side is going to happen in the left-hand side, left side as well. Well, one, of course, we have noticed that the height is t squared. Perhaps I have to write it here so that it doesn't disappear under the graph. Okay. So, what? Is it called sine function? Yes. Sine x over x, sine squared x divided by x squared, whatever it's called. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. There must be several terminologies for this, obviously. Okay, so what we do next is to identify these, the first zeros because this principal maximum is sort of restricted between these zeros, right? I will explain what do I mean by the principal maximum, but let's analyze those. Okay, what are the maxima, first of all, and the zeros? There are two sets of points which we need to identify. First, the maxima, there's no minima because it's a, it's a squared function. It doesn't go below the real axis. The maxima are obtained when this quantity is multiple of pi over 2, right? That is omega n i t over 2 is twice k plus 1 pi over 2, k is 0 and 1. So we have to qualify where it starts from. It starts from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, etc. So the lowest thing is when k equals 0, it is pi over 2. Okay. Lowest maximum. So how does it go? Let me just write it there, although it's a trivial matter still. It would be nice to see it. So these are pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2. Fine. And what about the zeros? Zeros are obtained when the, as the zeros of the sine function. So it is omega n, omega n i t over 2 kp, let's call it. k is again 0 and 1, etc. So let's write them. And I will, you'll see that 
they are not really correct. We have to do a selection of the subset depending on the presence of the central maximum. The presence of central maximum uh, modifies everything quite a lot. So the first, max, first zero would be zero. The second is pi. Let me try to use an aesthetic notation. And the second is 2 pi and the th 3 pi, etc. Why do I go through this rather simple analysis? It's because of the following. We, if we don't pay attention to this detailed profile, we see that at omega equals zero, we need to have a zero. Not really, because sine x over x or sine squared x over x squared. So this is not there. Instead, there is a principal maximum of height t squared. And what about the, the first maximum to be at pi over 2? In order to see this, we have to continue. The zero is at pi, and that's smaller than that. And there cannot be a maximum somewhere in here. So that's not there either. So once these are gotten rid of, we see how things go. Pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, 3 pi. So there's sort of this alternating values here. So the, the essential point here is that what is the value of this 0? The value of that 0 is it is pi, so it is, as I am plotting omega and i, so it is 2 pi over t. So that's 2 pi over t. This will be 4 pi over t, etc. And in between, there is the first maximum. And similarly here, I have the minus 2 pi over t. More or less, I have achieved everything I wanted to achieve through this graph. So what do I see? I see the following. The width of this principal maximum if, is what? It is this thing, right? 4 pi over t. Well, actually, it's not the width. It is the span of it at the axis. If you go sort of halfway through, it's going to be perhaps half the 4 pi over t. So, but the actual point which I would like to emphasize is it is 1 over t times a number, whatever that number is, pi or 2 pi, 1 over t. So the width is 1 over t, the height is t squared. So if t is large enough, this width becomes narrower and narrower, and height becomes taller and taller. And this principal maximum in the limit t goes to infinity, principal maximum approaches to a delta function, delta distribution, right? this not so precise language of calling it function. It's not a function. Well, function has a certain meaning in mathematics. It's that it doesn't have the properties of a function. It's a distribution, really. Delta distribution, perhaps. It's direct delta. So that was really the point of this sort of graphical analysis. But the, here, this is mathematics. At the physical, from physical perspective, we have to explain a little bit what do we mean by large t, infinite t. You have to remember the time scales in the microscopic world, in the quantum mechanical world. Well, here, of course, in the, in the macroscopic world, we think of in terms of the minimum seconds, right? Even we cannot think of seconds. Some people. 
they need a number of plus minus five minutes or plus minus a few minutes. But in microscopic world, things are is, uh, time spans are very short. How do we estimate the time span? Well, there are several things that you can uh, think of. Some beautiful analysis in the manner of Fermi or Feynman. You can, for instance, think of the time it takes for light to cross the size of an atom. It could be a typical uh, time, for instance. If this is the light and it has the speed of the speed c, which is a very huge number, then you can say the time here, delta t, is twice a0 divided by c, right? a0 is the Bohr radius and the diameter of the atom is twice a0 divided by c. So what is this? Twice h bar over mc alpha divided by c. So it is 2 h bar, 2 over alpha if you want, divided by mc. <coughs> this may be, or perhaps even there is no need, well this is exact, of, okay, but you may say this is already something we know of. What is a0? a0 is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, right? And so delta t is twice 10 to the minus 8 centimeters divided by 300,000 kilometer. 300,000 kilometers, 300 million meters. So I have to add to this, to, to convert into centimeters if you want. This is the kilometer, right? And in order to finish this computation, I have to multiply this with first by 1,000 to convert it into meters and then another 100 to convert into centimeters. So 10 to the 5 centimeter. You see 2 by 3, 10 to the minus 8, divided by 5 here, 5 here, 10. Well, this is order 1, right? And this is 10 to the minus 18 second. And quick, back of the envelope Typhester estimation is telling you that the time scales at the atomic level is very short. If you go to the nuclear level or subnuclear level, they are even shorter. This is at the atomic scale, 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So nucleus is uh, five orders of magnitude shorter than this. So if you think of, instead of crossing an atom, crossing a nucleus, you have to divide this by 10 to the, by 10 to the 5, so it becomes 10 to the minus 23 seconds. Well, this is the typical this, uh, time scales of nuclear physics. If you go even further to the uh, scale of quarks, then it goes to 10 to the minus 26 seconds. So micro world is quite strange and time scales are very short. Therefore, if you would like to define a large t time in mathematical sense, infinite time, it could be one second, right? as compared to the 10 to the minus 18 or 10 to the minus 23. So mathematically, t goes to infinity means a few seconds, actually. So we know what we are talking about. That's the physics part of it. So. How do we make some sense out of this? Perhaps a few minutes of discussion, although I don't uh, like this discussion that much, still as it's contained in certain books like Sakurai, we can
mention, just without putting too much emphasis. So you see this picture becomes sort of the following picture. Now if I, there is this very tall and very thin profile of the central maximum. What does it mean? It means that everything happens around omega ni goes to zero. That's a zero point. So as p goes to infinity, omega ni, you can think of Go, goes to zero, so everything essentially happens at that particular value means any appreciable transition from a specific initial state i to final specific state to n obeys the energy conservation law because omega n i was e n minus e i divided by the h bar it goes to zero means energy conservation is attained in the limit t goes to infinity. If you keep the potential on only for very short periods of time, at the order that we are talking about, 10 to the minus 18 or 10 to the minus 23 seconds, then that doesn't, uh, there is room for violation of energy conservation. And some of you who have seen quantum field theory course, you'll see that there are virtual transition energy may be, energy conservation may be violated at those scales. But at macroscopic scales, mathematically T goes to infinity limit energy is conserved. But can I say further, well this is the most precise thing that I can talk about in this context. But if you look at that figure, what do you see? What you see in here is the following. When you don't go to the t goes to infinity limit yet, there is the central profile. If t is reasonably large but not infinite, it is a tall one and moderately narrow but not zero width. Then what kind of relationship you have? The width is delta omega n i is at the order of 2 pi over t. t is sort of the time duration that it's kept on. Is it an interval? Sort of an interval. You turn it on and off. So there is a time interval and there is an energy interval in, in between everything is taking place. And Sakurai, for instance, wants to talk about this as follows. So he says this is the energy difference. And that's the time difference. So you have delta E times delta T is at the order of 2 pi H bar, which is H. Well, does it look like, I use a careful terminology, careful language, does it look like an, an uncertainty relation? Well, yes, if you really push the limit of interpretation a little bit. That's the energy interval the energy gap between initial and final states, so it is sort of an energy interval. And that's the time interval because that's the duration in which you keep the potential on. The energy interval times the time interval is about is at the order of h. If you, there may be factors of twos or one halves, but we, we're not concerned with those factors in here. So some kind of uncertainty relationship is happening. When t goes to infinity, indeed, delta e goes to zero. Again, it's also consistent with the uncertainty type of interpretation. I warn you that it's not an uncertainty relation. It's an uncertainty type of interpretation attributed to this expression. Why? Well, let's remember a little bit, because that's one of the fundamental problems of quantum mechanics, right? Uncertainty is a relationship between two conjugate operators, like x and p, or an angle and the angle of momentum, and stuff like that. 
it's, they satisfy certain computational relations to be, to be called conjugate. Then the uncertainties in the measurement of each correlated, for example, delta x times delta p should always be larger than h bar over 2. And that's a perfectly all right rigorous mathematical theorem that you can prove it. Here, energy, fine, energy is an operator, right? It's the Hamiltonian operator. But in quantum mechanics, one of the challenging problems is how to, how to define a time operator. And still, there are some people who are still working on it to define a time operator. As there is not a unique way of defining a time operator, so to call it an uncertainty relation between two conjugate operators is not that mathematically consistent. That's the reason why I say it's not an uncertainty relation, but it's an uncertainty type of relation involving these two physical intervals. I think that's, I, I shouldn't talk more about it, more than this, that's good enough. So let's move on to a little mathematical, further mathematical end. So what I would like to now turn my attention is the following. Well, that is the probability for the particular transition of a, from a given specific state, which I denoted as I, one of the eigenstates of the H0, and to a final specific, given specific state. Do I have a control on the final states? I don't. The only control we have or we might have is the energetics, the energy conservation. And that is only valid when T goes to infinity limit. The only thing we know is what should be the final energy in the T goes to infinity limit. But what are the states? Well, in principle, there may be infinitely many states having the same final energy as the initial one. That's called the degeneracy, right? Let me illustrate this on a well-defined example. Well, for instance, photoelectric effect, or we'll, this semester we are going to talk about scattering theory, so therefore I can eventually give you an example from scattering theory as well. But let's talk about the photoelectric effect. Well, what is the effect? Here is the electronic cloud, and here is the so-called tiny nucleus in here. Well, uh, what we have is, we have a light coming in and hitting the, it is of course a, not a precise picture. I'm trying to give you a, a diagram to, so that you can digress on. And it comes all the way down to, a, say, the innermost electron and it is absorbed. The electron absorbs this energy and if it is the incoming energy is larger than the largest gap between the ground and the, the highest, uh, highest bound state, then it comes out as a free object, right? And electron breaks away. Photon comes in, it ejects electrons. That's the famous photoelectric effect, which was originally introduced to physics in this context by Einstein. So what is the final state in here? Well, the, first of all, the, the energy should be, should be equal to the incoming energy of the photon plus the original uh, energy of that electron. So that's the energy conservation law. But is that a specific, unique state of electron that we are talking about? Of course not. We have infinitely many possible electron, ejected electron states satisfying this relationship. That is, EF, the final uh, energy of the final electron, it originally had an initial energy, bound state energy, say the ground state of the particular atom in consideration and it, uh, it has absorbed this particular amount of energy brought in by the photon. That is given and that's given so this is decided. It is after a few uh, seconds it's moving away as a free object 
it es escapes from the area of the atoms. So what is, as a free particle, it has this kinetic energy. And right hand side is this energy given to you as the initial energy. That's the energy conservation. For so much is unambiguous, there's no problem. But what is the state of the electron? If it is a free electron, a free particle, we know that its quantum mechanical wave function is going to be something like that. I'm not specifying the normalization. We are going to spend a, few, a lot of time today, probably. So let me not specify that explicitly, but that is the expression. For each PF, we have a given, for each PF, we have a given state of. So I put the label in here, saying that it labels define the state for you, PF. How many of these in principle? Well, if this is the conservation of the energy, it describes for you a sphere, right? Two sphere. PF squared is equal to a constant. So if I draw, plot that PF space, well, there are PFs all coming out of the surface with the same magnitude, right? PF magnitudes are the same, but they may come out in all directions. All these PFs give you one particular state of the electron. They all have the same magnitude because PF squared is equal to a given value, but their mag directions may be different. If directions are different, they are of different state. They are different states. So there are infinitely many states satisfying the same energy conservation law. So the point is the following. We have to now as the energy conservation only tells you what is the final, uh, what the final energy is, it cannot restrict what the states are. States, in principle, can be all those states having the same energy as the initial one. How do I take that into account, those states? I have to, instead of this one, I have to sum over all possible final states n having the satisfying the energy conservation law exactly in the t goes to infinity limit but if t is not infinite but large enough it is approximately equal to ei right the final energy according to that uncertainty like relationship so this one is really the correct expression that I have to handle. Not this one, but the sum is taken care of. Uh, all those n having that type of relation satisfied. How do I take, is there a systematic way of carrying out that summation? Well, there is a systematic way of carrying out the summation. If we remember the density of states concept rho en is the number of energy number of states per unit energy interval having the energy en so this is per unit energy interval so if i have to include all those into account i have to sum Why this summation? I said in only in the infinite t it is an exact conservation. So the final en is not equal to the ei. So there is a broadening. It's not a sharp level. It is a broadened level. Therefore, I have to integrate in that interval. And so this summation is replaced by this integral because this is counting the number of states falling into that small interval of the EN. Then I have to put that expression in. So 
So omega n e i was, let me write it in terms of the energy difference. E n minus e i squared. There is the four as well, so. Sine squared e n minus e i t by 2 h bar. So the expression has become a little more involved than the original one because of this mm, multiplicity in the final states associated with the e n. How do I carry out this integral? Well, in order to carry out this integral, I have to remind you one possible representation of the Dirac delta. Again, let me use a different color for this, and it's the following. Let me write the definition, and then we'll associate this representation with the expressions appearing in here. So limit, there's a parameter alpha, which is led to infinity sine squared alpha x divided by alpha x squared pi. You see, we are talking about not a function, but a distribution. And that's the reason why we always introduce these kind of limiting procedures to define Dirac delta. And we have already seen other representation. This is also one likely representation, which is suitable for our purposes. And if you would like to convince yourself this is indeed the Dirac delta, you just take this definition and substitute in the original definition, which is the most favorite, which is the simplest definition of the Dirac delta distribution. If f is a smooth function, and if you multiply average delta x with that and integrate in the entire in interval from minus infinity to plus infinity, then you should get to f0. That defines for you the delta x. If you take it to be at x minus a, say, then of course it comes out to be f of a. So you can wish, try to test that. And if you want, you can take the, your most favorite smooth function that you think of and verify that indeed it satisfied that relationship. So what we have to do next is just use this expression in there, and we have to make certain identifications now. What is the identification? Well, uh, first of all, we need a parameter which, go, which is large, which eventually goes to infinity in this definition of the representation of the Dirac delta. Do we have a physical parameter like that? Obviously, yes, because t is the parameter we have been taking to infinity, right? Large t. So the association is the following. Association with that thing is alpha is to be identified with the t. Alpha is the mathematical parameter which is appearing in our description. t is our physical parameter. What are the other things then? E x then in the mathematical expression should be associated with this particular physical expression. So then what the right-hand side becomes N with the energy relationship underneath CN1 squared. Here there is a subtlety. Perhaps I, can, uh, I will uh, mention it now before finishing it. Notice that we are summing over Integrating over the energy in a given interval means we are summing over the final. We are taking into account all the final states having the same approximate energy with the initial one. So we are summing over the final states. R is a given specific initial state. N is not a given specific initial state. How do I handle this? 
I replace the VNI with the average over the all the final n's and move it out of the integral. VNI squared, the average. Then what else? Once that is moved out, what is left over is DEN rho EN and then sine squared alpha x divided by alpha x squared. No, there, there is a need for t in here, right? So I will write it in the following fashion. Sine squared x alpha divided by, first of all, I have to convert this into that form as well. Let me, let me do it rather slowly. But that's a good point to stop. We'll, we'll do it cleanly after the break, okay?